So um, I'm going to give a talk today about probably 45 minutes, 50 minutes. I'll talk about the future, uh, where we headed, technologies. I'll talk about different aspects of innovation. And as well, um, I'll finish it up with my personal perspectives on innovation, what I've gained from my personal experience working about 20 years in different organizations at NASA. So uh, starting with the population, if you look at the population of the Earth from the beginning, uh, of the evolution of the modern human about 200,000 years ago until the year 1800. It's fascinating that we only have a population of less than 1 billion. In 200 years, we went then from less than 1 billion to about 7.5 billion people, and that trend will keep increasing as we reach to 2050 to reach about 10 billion people. And that is fascinating growth. Uh, even though there is um, some continent, uh, the growth is st stagnant or, not, or decreasing like in Europe, uh, it's expected that the African continent is going to contribute significantly to that population growth um, in the world. Uh, something interesting is, at the same time we have that, uh, the, the exponential growth of technology is something that we've never ever seen before. If you look at the computational power that's expected in the next 30, 40, 50 years, so in the year 2035 approximately, we expect the computational power is going to be equivalent to one human brain. And if we keep extrapolating that, by the year 2065, 2070, all humanity's brains will be able to be put in a single computational power. Now imagine the possibilities of that. Imagine having a small, laptop, lap, a small iPhone in your pocket and being so powerful that, that you can do so many things. Now, th there's a concern, though, because you know, we're talking about huge population growth, huge te exponential technology that's going to be able to have big impact on, on the job market. So, so experts will typically tell you that when there is a new, there, when there is a new technology, that typically creates jobs, and that is exactly uh, correct, no question. But the problem is, uh, we're talking about different thing here. We're talking about artificial intelligence and advanced robotics. So we, com we combine these two things. It's a very powerful thing. It's almost like we're creating almost new species. So imagine a ro humanoid robot with a computational power of billions of people being able to think about things a human would never be able to do. And how, how does it fit into the into, 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 into world, into the life, into the economy? So that's going to be very challenging. And um, so this is a very controversial topic. If you, if you talk to all the scientists, researchers, uh, they will tell you uh, almost 50-50 uh, almost distribution. 50 will tell you, no, this is going to be good. It's going to be creating more jobs. And 50 are very, very concerned, actually. They tell you this is going to have fundamental impacts on the way we live and economies, and jobs, and, and, and everything else. Um, I, I think even the economies will probably look different in, in the future. So if you have a huge amount of, of people without a job, and, and a lot of the things are being automated, that's going to be a big, big impact. So, um, and it's not going to happen suddenly, obviously. It's going to be a transition. Um, and I can tell you from our personal experience in the mission control uh, at NASA, we had initially, when they had the Apollo program, we had back rooms with, with hundreds of people supporting people in the front room. And um, as we kept advancing, we went to the shuttle where the computational systems became a little bit more advanced. And, um, and basically, we didn't need that many people. And now with the new ones, the new generations for the future ones, it's getting less and less and less. So, so it will be transition. So jobs will not be requiring as many people to do them. But at the end, there's going to be a, a significant impact. Um, I have a lot of doctor friends. I always joke with them. So uh, look at, at an example of how the power of these um, artificial intelligence uh, systems will be in the market. So if you are a primary care physician and, um, and you, you have a patient, the patient will tell you what the symptoms are, you'll base, um, take what you've learned, your experience, what you know from medical school, and you'll try to do a diagnosis. And often there's percentages that there's misdiagnosis. So on the other hand, look at an opportunity where you talk to, to a system that has access to every single medical research paper ever published, every single uh, um, analysis from, or case studies from, from uh, hospitals, every single book. Uh, and not only that, it can actually gather all this information in big data and be able to find trends and, 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 and diagnosis that nobody will ever be able to do, uh, only a human uh, being will be able to do. So look at the power. So how is a primary care physician be able to compete with something like that? And the same thing with lawyers, the same thing with engineers, same thing with pilots. Um, we can, can go on and on and on. Uh, sometimes we have talks about, you know, argue about what job 
is going to be difficult to replace. And obviously, there's a lot of jobs will be uh, difficult to replace by, by, by automations and, and intelligent systems. But um, the key is it's going to be uh, a significant impact. We're not saying that the, the future is going to be all robots and nothing else. But what we're saying is there's definitely something to think about because it's going to be, be coming soon. And it's going to have tremendous impacts on all of us. So the, the thing is, um, we need to be able to tackle these problems or, or this um, upcoming technology. We need to start thinking about it from today. We need to engage academic institutions. We need to engage uh, government, uh, uh, industry, everybody working together. Um, and, and that's uh, the only way that we're able to tackle everything in advance. Uh, uh, talking about um, uh, technologies and, um, and, and te the gap between what academia is producing and what the government and what industry, there is a lot of disconnect between the technologies produced and then what's being used. Uh, you have a lot of corporations, for example, that uh, produce technologies and, and they do patents and then they put them on the side. Same thing with academia. You can go to any academic institutions and talk to the technology transfer office and you see hundreds of IP and patents nobody is, is, is willing to use because they have no use for it. So I believe before you do something and invest in developing a new technology, you have to be aligned with who's going to be your customer before you invest in it. So by the time you have this uh, achieved and completed, there is the line that's going to take it uh, and create a new, new industry, a new business. Uh, and, and that's how we're going to bridge the gap and capitalize on the technologies and the research and development, not only for the sake of just putting it in, in portfolios, but make sure it's being used and, and we capitalize on it as much as possible. So let me give you a quick example why we are interested in innovation at NASA. So recently, the, the last few years, we retired the space shuttle program. And um, the intention from the space shuttle program was to build the, the space station. Uh, the space station is the national, international lab. And we're learning so much every single day about the behavior of the human body in, in the space and microgravity environment. Uh, we're learning about the long-term effects on humans uh, from the radiation, uh, gravity environment, and so on. Uh, obviously, there's big effects on the, on the muscles, on the bones, on the vision, on the um, psychology. So when we send somebody to, to, to deep space exploration, we need to understand these things. Because in space station, if there's any problem, any issues, obviously, we can bring them back fast. But when you're talking about sending somebody to Mars, which a mission could take six to eight months to a year, depending on what, uh, what, what uh, way you go in there, it's a big problem. Uh, it's a big, big issue. So we need to understand a lot of these issues before we invest and, and, and commit to sending a person uh, or a crew to, to, an, to a different planet. So right now, the, the three options that initially we had was going to the moon again and establishing a permanent base, um, going to an asteroid, or going to Mars. And recently, it seems the emphasis is headed toward going to Mars, and that's where we're going to be going. So by doing that, uh, obviously, there are significant challenges, a lot of issues we're going to be facing. So we're going to be creative as much as, as possible because the limitations in funding and technology, uh, either we become creative, innovative, and we think out of the box, or everything will be much more complicated uh, to solve. And uh, if you notice, now we have a lot of com new commercial, new space um, uh, emerging, and they're working in the low Earth orbit, what we call the Earth, low Earth orbit. Uh, after we finish that, now we're concentrating going deep, and we're establishing them, that market uh, to, to, to the commercial uh, thing. If you look at, uh, at what NASA's contribution and the government's contribution in creating jobs and creating innovation as well, we, early on in the century, we invested heavily in creating uh, the basic research of aeronautics. Um, and, and that resulted in, in establishing companies like Boeing, Lockheed, um, and so on, that, that are creating significant amount of jobs and, uh, and a huge uh, gross domestic project, uh, product. The same thing we're doing right now, like I said, with the commercial, is uh, uh, with the developing technology and giving uh, everything and enabling the commercial entities to work in the low Earth orbit, is that by the year 2014, uh, it was approximately $330 billion um, uh, worthwhile. And that trend obviously will keep increasing. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some other stuff in terms of miniaturization, how it's impacting uh, technology, making it better, more effective, and so on. So uh, what are the main technologies that will be mainstream in the next 10 years, let's say, approximately? So big data, obviously, is going to be an, one of them. Uh, big data, Internet of Things. Um, now, the thing is, big data is nothing without 
having um, a system that can go through it and be able to s decipher the big data and make something meaningful out of the information that you have. Otherwise, just um, junk data, this, it's worthless. Look at medical records. If you can have uh, millions of people's medical records and, and go through them, and, and I'm sure there are trends that currently we don't understand, but there's actually correlations between certain things. So they will be able to do diagnosis or pre prevent disease before they happen. And even when they happen, they'll be able to find uh, ways um, how to be able to, to solve in a much more effective way by, by, by deciphering uh, millions and billions of data points uh, because we have such strong and robust uh, artificial intelligence systems. Driverless cars. Uh, so I got uh, familiar with the driverless cars when I was at Ames. Uh, you see the little Google cars driving by all the time. It's kind of fascinating. And um, I think this by, in, by itself could have huge impacts on the market. So if you look, uh, what are the, the benefits from having driverless cars? So you will have zero accidents. That's a, the point. Uh, obviously, um, initially, uh, the, the way we do it is we need to do run more cases. So the more information we have, the algorithms becomes refined, and, and that's when you become getting better and better. So the more cars we have, the more we drive, the better the algorithms and, 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 and everything is, is working properly. So imagine having a car with, with no accident, because most of the time accidents are human-based, so if we can prevent that, that's going to be a big advantage. Another thing is um, becoming productivity. Look how much productivity we are wasting by driving, and some people, and especially in the States, they have to commute for hours and so it's, 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 it's completely wasted productivity. Uh, traffic, there will be no traffic anymore. First of all, there will be significantly less cars. Second, cars will be able to communicate with each other, so you can drive faster, close to each other, and, and so will let you go much faster without creating a congestion than highways that we typically see every now and then. Uh, pollution, there won't be many pollution. Um, psychological effects on people, like um, uh, when people reach certain ages, they, they won't be able to drive anymore. And that causes huge impacts. I've seen it from my, my brother, my, my father-in-law. When he got 80, he got his driver license uh, taken. And, and you can see a big impact on people. So all that stuff will be something of the past. Now, the thing is, uh, how, what, how is that going to disrupt the industry? So typically, we, if you look at an average house in, in the States, we have two to three cars per, per house. And there is absolutely no need to have more than one car. Even having several cars for the, for the neighborhood, that's what the trend is going to be headed for. So you're not, you're not going to be able to, to manufacture as many cars because there is no need for many cars. Insurance companies, two things. First of all, they don't have as many cars to, to insure. And second, why would you insure a car if there is zero accidents, right? So, so you need to be thinking about these kind of things. Uh, and then uh, manufacturers, uh, maintenance facilities, oil and gas. Uh, imagine how much oil and gas we consume. So we'll be imagine if you reduce it by a fraction, the amount of cars, and then obviously, as all of us see, not only is going to be much less cars, but we'll, we're headed toward electricity and maybe solar and renewable energy. So how are all these industries going to be impacted? Uh, I think we need to, to start sitting together and, and brainstorming, strategizing about the future, because this is coming. There's no question. It's just a matter of time. So if you work on it from today, you'll have much better impact and be able to, to position yourself in the market. Miniaturization. Look at this interesting thing. Um, in 1956, it, that's five megabytes. <laughs> and, 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 and look at what, what we have today and, and keep going on that trend. I can't even imagine how, wh what's going to happen. You know? so, so in terms of miniaturization, um, the last 25 years, uh, people that needed satellite, a satellite used to cost maybe 100, 150, 200, depending what it, what it is. And the average age also of service used to be tens of years in the decades. And uh, the, the thing now is uh, that, that what changed the market is we have miniaturization. So a lot of these big components, we can put them significantly smaller. And then the technology is changing at such a pace that if you send something and you want to work for 20 years, the first, first five years is going to be obsolete because technology has already uh, overcome it. So by having, for example, the satellite business, if you have micro CubeSats, you send them, they last about a year, and, uh, and then they come down. So it's an opportunity for you to, to keep replenishing it with the, with the state-of-the-art technology. And then access to space is, getting, space is getting much cheaper, then it's not a problem to keep replenishing it. So it's not a cost um, inhibitor. Uh, it used to be $10,000 per pound, $1,000 per pound, we're getting to $100 per pound. And now there are companies, commercial companies, um, for example, there's one in New Zealand called uh, Rocket Labs, 
they're developing a robot, I'm sorry, a, a rocket made from composite, and uh, they're supposed to get the price of pound uh, to orbit about $10 or so. So, so you, can you can see the trend. So that by itself is going to open a huge amount of markets. And, and Google actually was in, uh, you guys were involved in, in some satellite uh, things at, um, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, augmented reality, uh, that's uh, something of importance, of significant importance. Uh, not only augmented reality, but also uh, in terms of virtual reality. But wearing the glasses, for example, we look at, at them in, um, in the in space station or even go into to different places where you can, mission control can see exactly what you're looking at. You can give you instructions on the screen. And I know Google came with the Google glasses and we, we did some, some work with them to, to, in terms of partnerships, experiments, some um, how can be used and uh, stuff like that. And um, in the medical field can, can have significant impact. And then we're talking about virtual reality. It's gonna be so mature, uh, it's gonna impact several sectors. Even the tourism sector will be, will be part of that. So these are things that uh, are, are gonna be so common um, as we move forward. Autonomous flying vehicles, uh, I mean, who, who, who heard about that 20 years ago? And now it's like almost everybody can have a small uh, Android, a uh, small UAV. And um, it's the, the good thing about them is they're establishing to new markets. So the key is we're talking about so many technologies here. But the key is, how do you develop service industries to align with those? So the internet, when it came, it was technology. And look at what industry has created because of the technology that it was the, the foundation. So same thing with, these, with all these technologies and even other technologies as well. We know they're going to be there. We know they're going to be mainstream. How can you align your business models to create um, uh, services that will service all these industries? That is the key here. Uh, 3D manufacturing, uh, no question, is, is, is going to be uh, something of significant importance. For us, uh, if we go to Mars, for example, there is no point of on, uh, you know, getting so many spare parts with us because it's very heavy, and we don't know what's going to fail. We don't know if we've taken a spare part and we're not going to use it. So it makes perfect sense just to have um, uh, a 3D printing machine, and the, whenever you need something, they beam the file, and you, you print it there. And not only you can print it, but we can use the soil. We've been doing some analysis um, and research using the soil, uh, soil of Mars to create actually the feedstock to create these components. So it will be very, very effective and very efficient. Um, another thing also is uh, when you create very intricate parts, when you have a launch environment, sometimes it's very difficult to get these things intact onto orbit. So you'll be able to manufacture a lot of the stuff in, uh, in space. And then it has, you can look at medical industry, look into uh, organ, uh, reproduction with the 3D machines. Um, you can look into food industry. They're even talking about apparel as well, shirts. You can, you can start printing shirts in the future. There are some people say that in, in, the, in the distant future, uh, you'll be able to download a file for the shirt that you want, and you'll be able to print it in a facility and be access to immediately to it. Now, the thing is, we, we talked about a lot, lot of technologies. But again, there is a big, big thing as cybersecurity. If you don't have a robust cybersecurity, then it's going to be difficult to have uh, effectiveness in everything we just, we just discussed. Driverless cars, for example, you're driving to work, or the, the car is taking you to work, uh, and somebody hacks into it and, and takes it. So um, these things are, are going to happen. And unfortunately, it's, um, it's, it's a risk. So cybersecurity is very, very essential that we understand how to, how to, how to build robust systems will be able to, uh, and capable of defending and, and making sure everything is safe. Um, I'll give a couple of examples about some disruptive uh, industries. So uh, the first one, I'll talk about Zara. So Zara is um, it's a clothing uh, store. And right now, we have, they have about 2,000 stores worldwide. And um, when they started, uh, people have serious doubts that will be successful. It's a very competitive industry. And um, getting into it, it's almost unheard of. So what these people did, they found a gap. There's always a gap in, 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 in any business. So the thing is, if you're successful filling the gap, um, you will be successful. The key is finding what is the gap and, and do a flawless execution. So what these people did, uh, when, when, you, when you go to a store and you, you see a, a clothing garment, it takes about a year from the time designers put it together until it hits the shelves in stores. It's about 12 months. So what, what Zara did is they reduced that time to two weeks. So a designer can, can draw something. Until it hits the shelves, it only takes about two weeks. And then what they did is also they create a sense of scarcity. So they, they create only a very limited amount of, uh, 
of shirts, of pants, of dresses, and whenever they're sold out, that's it. They're not gonna do them again. So you're feeling that you're buying a shirt, man. You, it's very unique. It's, uh, it's very scarce. Not a lot of people will be, have access to it. And, um, and not only that, if you walk to any of the stores, they have managers with their uh, laptops, with their um, iPads, and, and taking notes, talking to customers, and taking notes. Okay, what do you like about this shirt? Uh, uh, do you like anything different about it? I mean, would it make sense if this was like this or like that? And they send all that information into the headquarters, and they have analysis of, the, of what the, the, the customers want, and they see big uh, area that people are interested in, well, guess what? Two weeks later, they have the shirt with all this input that people had, and they keep doing this iteration over and over, and, and, and they're becoming so successful. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm surprised almost everywhere I go, um, I see that company. Before, it, I only used to see it in Spain. When I used to Spain, I used to, I like this, they had very nice design. I used to buy stuff there. But now you can see it anywhere, even in Asia, in Europe, in the United States. I mean, everywhere they have stores, and very, very successful. The owner actually is one of the richest guys in the world right now. Netflix. So everybody obviously knows Netflix, but I want to highlight um, how finding a successful business model is not enough. You have to keep innovating and moving forward and adapting. So uh, um, at that time, when, when, the, when <coughs> Netflix came in, Initially, people were having issues going to Blockbuster. I used to hate it. G get, I love movies, but I used to hate going to Blockbuster, you know, renting it, uh, because I, I never had time to, to go and return it in time. And almost every single time, it cost me about $10, $15 just to rent a movie, and it became um, very annoying. So when the technology changed from VHS to DVD, then Netflix came in with, uh, with the brilliant uh, distribution scheme, and they put it in major cities, so you, will, you were able to get a DVD in one or two days maximum. And they changed the, the model from going to rent to a subscription model. So, so people were subscribed to, to the service and were able to get one or two DVDs per month or, and getting access to that. So after they did this, they, they became extremely successful and uh, even offered to, 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 to sell themselves to Blockbuster, but Blockbuster didn't see the values. They continued on their own and they eventually ended up failing. But what happened with, with this, they weren't satisfied. So when the technology became mature enough that the internet became fast and broadband, they started streaming the movies. People get anxious. You know, they don't, the, the patience goes down and down. It, the more technology we have, people don't want to wait one or two days. They want to, right now, I'm getting it. I, I want to get access immediately to it. So they started the biggest streaming libraries available in the market, and they became extremely, extremely successful. Again, did not satisfy. They were not satisfied because that's, a, that's an area other people can come into it and, and take advantage of it and, and be, have it into the market. So they, they went actually into the production. So it became a production company. And from the production company, they, they became like that, a very successful company. Look at the, at the, um, at the smartphone companies. How much impact they had the GPS on radio, on the camera, music, gaming. It's having a big, big impact on a lot of aspects, actually. And that's very, very essential. That tells you you have to be looking at a small uh, companies that can have a big impact on, on what you're doing. Um, if, you, if you look at the startups, um, sometimes a lot of these uh, activities come from, from garages. Uh, people work in a small garage. And you have to look into, into what's going on because uh, that's where most of the ideas will come from. All right, and um, I'll give you a couple examples about how to become creative, basically. So there was a city in Europe that uh, people were having uh, problems with posters, having posters there, and, uh, and it was ruining a lot of the architecture that we're having. And uh, so they thought about having, how can we pr reduce that? So the, they talked to the city, and they, they met several times, and they were having issues with that. So they started putting uh, posters with, uh, with the stamp, with dates, saying, okay, well, uh, this is... Uh, <coughs> Uh, this is putting a, a date thing, okay, date change, or uh, the, the, the template, uh, it's been canceled, and, and that made it start making some, some differences uh, with what they tried to do. Uh, there's also a speeding ticket program. Uh, there's a small town in Europe, they were having a lot of issues with the speeding cars. So one of the people came up with a brilliant idea. They said, well, what if we actually implement a program where we um, give some of the, the benefits to the pe people that are not speeding. So they put cameras in these towns, and the cameras capture the, the cars that were speeding and the cars that were not speeding. And the cars with not speeding were actually uh, being put on the side, and they developed uh, a model where 70% of the proceeds go to the, to, the, to the city, 
and 30% of the proceeds go to the people that were not speeding. So you're rewarding the people that are not speeding, at the same time you're getting value because you're still making 70% uh, profit, and that had huge, huge impact in, in, um, in having uh, reductions in speeding cars in that specific town. Uh, there was a company in, in Holland that, um, that uh, manufactured advanced, um, advanced bicycles with a lot of um, advanced electronics, and they were having a lot of problems in shipping, uh, where a lot of it were getting damaged. So what they did, one of the people came up with a brilliant idea saying, why don't we package it like it looks like a TV? And um, by doing that, just simple as that, they noticed 70 to 80% reduction in the amount of damage that people were having. But, but, so that tells you the, the amount of uh, creativity. <laughs> so um, a lot of innovation actually is derived from nature. It, um, it's interesting how nature actually is very innovative in sense, right? So it's a lot of things can be derived from there. So about um, a couple of years ago, I was in Japan and I went with a professor to, uh, in one of the weekends to a lotus farm. And uh, I was, you know, I lo looked at that. I said, man, that's kind of interesting. Look at that. The water never sticks to the, to the plant. It keeps going back and forth. And then he told me a story that uh, some of the Japanese scientists actually investigated the leaves and the microstructure and developed the lead for the yogurt um, uh, containers, that uh, the yogurt never sticks to it. And that tells you, you know, just looking at something in nature, how you adapt it and, and you move it forward. Uh, the same thing with the underwater uh, turbines. So uh, that's a way to generate electricity from uh, underwater currents. And there is a lot of drag and, and, and they weren't as effective. So they uh, did an analysis of the whales, of the fins, and they noticed these ridges on the fins they create significantly less drag and they're much more effective. So this, this, they put uh, uh, this area into, into the analysis and design and they come up with new fans that look like this and they were sig significantly more effective than conventional uh, fan that they had before. So I'll, I'll tell you now about um, some cross-industry innovation, how uh, combining in uh, innovation in different industries, you create something uh, very meaningful. So in Africa, some of the poor countries, they were getting um, gifts um, uh, and grants as an incubator for, for babies. The problem was is whenever you have a, a failure uh, and you need to have replacement of component, they didn't have access to that. So as, as soon as they had that, they used to put it on the side in storage and that's it, they had no use for it. So then they started thinking about, okay, uh, how can we solve that problem? So they had teams of people, uh, uh, consultants, they, they investigated what's going on. And they found out that uh, one of the Toyota four-wheel cars is very popular in this region. So they came together and said, well, what if we create something that we can leverage on the parts from this car to, to, to be able to replace any components from, uh, from the incubator? And they came actually with, with one a very interesting design that can completely be replaced with parts from the car. And that solved the problem and, and created much, much more value. Now that's a fascinating story. So this is a car mechanic from Argentina. So um, if you think a car mechanic, you know, okay, let's see how it goes. Um, they, were, they were in dinner one day having uh, wine, drinking wine, and I guess they were drinking so much wine that you know, one of the guys just messed up and put the, the cork inside the bottle. And then they started betting, how can we get the, the cork out of the bottle without breaking the bottle itself? And, and they started playing, having different methods and nobody was successful. And this guy came in, uh, put a plastic bag, and tried to twist it across the, the cork, inflated it, and got the cork out without a problem. Then the fascinating thing is how, how about, uh, that's an excellent example about how do you think outside, you know, take it to one, one step further. He had a gynecology friend, he was good friends with him, so he started talking to him about, look, what I found, is there any, any way we can, we can actually use that in real life? How can we use it in delivery? So guess what? They came up with a system um, that's actually extremely cheap, to, to deliver babies in, in poor countries where they don't have access to more sophisticated equipment. And by doing that, you see, from a party to a cork to, to finding something that can save thousands and tens of thousands of people's lives in developing country. And, and that's extremely low cost by just thinking completely out of the box. So Dyson actually um, came to solve a big problem. Uh, the thing with, with, with vacuum cleaners, the minute you start cleaning, the filter gets clogged almost immediately. And the more clog you have, the more dust, then the less effective it has in, in, in the suction capabilities. So Dyson came in the late 70s and started looking about, uh, how can I solve this problem? So lo he looked into the sawmill, and uh, he saw the sawmill actually uh, with the revolution of, of the air, uh, the dust falls down, and the, the air goes from a different conduct. And um, 
and that's also an example of how you can solve problems from uh, looking at different industries, but also it's an excellent uh, example of persistence. So Dyson, in 1979, created almost 5,000 prototypes until he found the perfect model. So it tells you you have to be persistent, you have to look outside, you have to, to, to look into other, other venues. Uh, together is what, what gives you actually success, and that's, that's exactly what he did. He became extremely successful. Their, their revenue is getting close to a billion dollars, actually. It's, it's an amazing company. It's one of the best vacuums you can see. And by the way, I don't have stock in Dyson, so just... just <laughs> 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 so combining innovations, um, I'll just give you also a quick example. It's a, the, the easiest form of, um, of finding new innovative ideas by having two innovations and combining them into one. So the, the, the first one is um, the Coke, uh, the bottles and the cans, and then they have a new, a new design. Actually, it's combined both of them. It's a, <coughs> it's a can and, uh, I'm sorry, the, the cap, and you open it like if, if it was a can. It's kind of very unique. And then the cronut. Uh, the cronut, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> the donut and the, and the croissant. And um, uh, Kian was saying that there is a very nice uh, cronut place here in Dublin. I didn't get a chance to go see it, but uh, it seems like a good deal. Um, open innovation, so we've been extremely successful at NASA leveraging on opening innovation. Uh, most of the time, solutions come from completely different industries besides yours. And it's, it's very important that you take advantage of that. So we look at the case study done by Harvard uh, uh, Medical School uh, to, to develop an algorithm to, to improve the, the megablast uh, nucleotide sequencing. So the first uh, run, they spent uh, several years, and they spent about $2 million developing this algorithm. And uh, they got a solution in 4.3 hours, and it was actually very, not very accurate, about 72%. Then they hired two postdocs, and the postdocs uh, spent about a year. They paid them $120,000, and they were able to reduce the, the time from 4.3 hours to 47 minutes, and the accuracy w went up from 72 to 77. And then they took advantage of the open innovation uh, platforms, and they put it in the market. And by doing that, they were able to reduce the time from 4.3 hours to 16 seconds, the accuracy went to 80%, and they only spent $6,000. And the solutions, uh, this is actually the best solution. If you look at the, at, the, at the chart here, all these things above the green are better solutions than the original one, and significantly cheaper. But that tells you the power of open innovation. And um, there is a concern, though, for, for people understand them talking to different industries. If you advertise your, your, your problems, your gaps, then you're opening it to the competitor to see what's going on uh, in your company. So it could be a challenge. And that's why maybe some people haven't taken as much advantage of that uh, technology. But recently, they've been finding ways to, to, to make it anonymous and, uh, and, and break it down into, into, into component level, not the, the whole system, to break it down to component level to solve the problem. And then you can get solutions without knowing and advertising uh, what your issues are to potential competitors in the field. So I'll give you quick perspectives on in innovation based on uh, what I've seen in the, in the past uh, 20 years and things that worked for me. How can we make um, an environment more creative? What roadblocks do I get? And I'll talk about some of that stuff. So there is, um, first of all, people think um, innovation or being creative, you are born creative. And, and that, is, that is true, you know, some of us are much, much more creative than others, but, um, but still, I think um, there are tools that you can do to significantly improve your creativity. Um, you can talk to people that are very creative, engage with them, you can read articles, you can see cases, and you can be in an environment that's very creative, and, and eventually, you will be, uh, your creativity level, I guarantee you, definitely is gonna go up. Um, I've, I've tried that myself as well. I've noticed an improvement of uh, getting to certain environments in terms of innovation. And also, an innovation has two components, actually. There is revolutionary and there is evolutionary. So evolutionary is kind of easier to get, but, um, but doesn't give you as much value. And then revolutionary, uh, or as it's being called, moonshot. And they call it moonshot because it's a, it's, it's a problem so difficult to solve. But if you solve it, it has game-changing implications. And uh, so th there's two different ones. The second one, the revolutionary, is very difficult. But if you get it, companies actually have business, business products that completely have an impact on the whole industry. And it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing process. Now, as most of you know, innovation is very risky. So don't put all your eggs in one basket, because it's very, very probable that uh, most of the innovation ideas will fail. 
but you have to be keep doing it because definitely you'll have some success that will make some difference in, in your business and will have big impact. In terms of employees, they're typically farmers and hunters. So farmers, they want, just want to have their domain. They want to work on it. They don't want anything new. They're just kind of nurturers of, of ideas. And farmers, they want just going back and forth, back and forth. You can't keep them in one place. So the challenge is how do you keep both of them together and create an environment that uses farmers to get ideas, maybe, and then give them, pass them to farmers and work together synergistically to create a very solid group that actually can give you the best results possible. Uh, when you come, um, when it's come times to, to come up with, with ideas and you're de developing solutions, it's very, very important that you make people feel they are part of the solution. Um, obviously, you can direct people to do things, but if people actually believe in what they're doing and they believe they have direct input into, into what's being done, it will go way, way longer as opposed to just directing somebody to do something. Because you feel this, okay, this is part of my product. I'll, you'll find them often spending significant amount of times way beyond what they expected to do because they have a passion and, and, and they felt ownership on, on what's going on. And in terms of innovation, I'm um, sorry, um, uh, ideation, it's, it's a very important element and uh, you guys use design thinking, which innovation, uh, ideation is part of it. And it makes a big difference, the composition of the team. So the more diverse the team in terms of diversity of age, technical, um, uh, cultural, Ages, I mean, so many aspects needs to be um, diverse. The more diverse, the better ideas you will get. And, and also people from different, indus your different uh, industries than the one you're at, because um, that will give you very, very different views of what you're trying to do. And then concentrate on quality and quantity, not quality. So try to develop as many ideas as possible, as fast as possible. And don't judge any ideas, because if, you, if you're in a meeting, for example, and trying to brainstorm and you keep shooting people down, then nobody else can contribute anymore. The, the energy in the room will go down significantly. And try to emphasize on the using yes and, I like your idea and we can do that. I think this is a good thing and we can combine it with the other person instead of saying yes, but, you know, because as yes and is the key to continuing the, the, the process of creating uh, flawless ideas. Uh, how many times did we feel failure is not, is not an option? And um, as a matter of fact, failure is completely an option. And the more we fail sometimes, is less we learn so many aspects and so many benefits we get out of that. The thing is, it's not an option when you have a rocket ready for launch and with people, there is absolutely not an option. But before you get there, you have to fail. You know, that's how you learn. And uh, we were discussing earlier, uh, there are companies um, that actually have programs to reward the failures that they had and how people were able to, to learn from the failures and, and, and move it uh, like that. I think um, uh, in, at Google, every Friday, thank Google at Friday, you guys discuss also some failures as well, which is fascinating, because sometimes people only, executives only discuss ideas um, or products that are successful, and they barely mention the failures, so that is an outstanding thing to share with people, because it can show you, if this is, you open this door, there's a there's block behind it, so don't do that, go there. You, there is always a learning process. I mean, there's nothing wrong with failing, unless it's, uh, it's the last thing that you do with the final product. And this famous guy, you know, has a very interesting quote in that regard as well. <laughs> so I think this statement's probably one of the biggest killers to innovation that I have seen. It's, uh, you find it every single time. Well, I'm not interested, this is perfect. Why do I need to improve, you know, what's, what's going on with that? I mean, think about it, I mean, we could, would have been riding horses now to work instead of cars, you know, because uh, you find something that works doesn't mean that's going to be working to get, uh, forever. You, kept, you need to keep improving, make it modifying it, make it better. And uh, we, we, we give the example of Netflix, and that's a small example. There is thousands of examples like that. You always need to be keep modifying, increasing, because otherwise somebody else is going to come and take your place. Uh, it's always, cause always people creative that can come with, it, with brilliant ideas. So um, I think, in my opinion, this was uh, something Im really embedded in the culture. And it's very, one of the things that are very difficult to change, but eventually uh, you'll be able to do it with, uh, with enough um, effort. And in terms of benchmarking, that, I, I use that a lot. I, I try to go to companies, especially outside of the aerospace company, and try to see um, how they do the governance, uh, the business models, how they work, how the employees, uh, how do they work with the employees. It's very, very important. Um, even if, you, if anybody is successful, it always there's value by, by talking to different people and learning different perspectives, how people look into things, and I guarantee you, you'll always, always learn things. And even a company is not very successful, there's always benefits you can gain from them. And together, when you start collecting all this value, all this information, 
it gives you better insight when you're trying to plan a strategic um, uh, business plan for the future. So risk is very important. Um, I mean, for us, for example, if you don't take risk, you're not going to launch anything because there is, everything is risky. The key is taking measured risk, right? And they, uh, they ask um, the president, the CEO of, of, of BMW, why he decided to take risk and invest in the electric cars. And he said, because invest doing nothing is biggest risk. And we can see it's, um, uh, there's a big trend now to go into uh, toward electric cars. And investing early will give you definitely a significant advantage compared to investing late. Uh, you'll always um, have an advantage by doing that. So I had a conference um, last September. And um, it's an interesting quote that by the president of Toyota that he came and shared with us. And he said, if executives say, say this will be a success, it will probably fail. If they don't see the value, there's you know, hope for that. And that tells you about the disconnect sometimes between the top level executives and the working force and the managers and the directors. So there's definitely room for improvement. And he was referring for, for the Prius. He's, refer he's referring to the Prius where a lot of executives were completely against going with such a product. And it turned out to be one of the best products that Toyota has ever put together. So um, that's something definitely to think about. Now, when it comes to protection innovation, um, most of the corporations, whenever there is downturn in profit, one of the first things they cut is research and development and innovation. So the key is, how can you shelter that? Because it's, it's, it's true, it's, uh, you're going through a downturn, but you, if you don't keep investing, then when the downturn goes up, somebody else that has been invested is already ahead of you in terms of technology and developing products. So even in down times, down air, down when, when products are, when the market is not good, you need to keep continue investing in, in innovation, research, and development, because that is definitely the future. And some, some organizations, they, they, they go way out of the way to shelter them and, and make, protect them because they, they see the value in, the, in doing that. So um, I, I go a lot to, to the Google main campus and I have some friends there. And it's fascinating, um, uh, the, the, env the, the environment that you encounter, similar to the environment you have here. And basically, mm, t talking to them, they mentioned is you cannot force innovation, but you can create an environment in which innovation can allow to exist, which is exactly right. There is no way you can force somebody to be innovative, but if you change the culture, if you change the environment, the governance, then all these kind of things will, will inspire people to be more creative, and more innovative, and in, in return will make a big difference. Now, in terms of uh, uh, where does innovation stop? Because we have a lot of young people with, with impressive ideas. And uh, often you, you hear executives saying, oh, we need to do innovation, we need to do all that stuff. But uh, where does it stop? So if, if executives are interested, if employees are bringing the ideas, why aren't companies so innovative? It typically stops in the middle management, uh, and that's because risk. People are not comfortable taking risk because if you take risk, you're, you're, you might create uh, some, some issues for, for your availability in the, in the company and, and stuff like that. So innovation, obviously, is a risky business. There's always going to be a risk of failing, and as, as, as a matter of fact, very high risk of failing. But if we don't do it, like I said, it's, you're not going to be able to keep making progresses. So there needs to be a way that executives force uh, middle management and put it in the performance evaluation that they are supposed to go out and take risk, measure risk, and be able to push uh, technology forward as much as possible. Uh, now, in terms of um, environment uh, and, and organization, if you notice, uh, kids, um, the kids are fascinating. They can draw something like this, for example. This is my daughter. <laughs> and, uh, and she painted me like this, my wife. It's kind of interesting. And she was, I think, four at this age. And, um, I was thinking, if I took that drawing and said, man, this, what is this crap, you know, and put it in the trash, imagine how, would have, how it would have affected her psychologically. But you take that and you say, man, this is awesome, this is great. And you should see some of the drawings she does now. It's impressive, very fascinating. But, you know, you can translate that into the culture. You have to develop an environment where, where you, nobody's ridiculed. Every idea is a good idea, you know. You, obviously, you can have the options uh, to implement it or not to implement it. But you cannot allow uh, an environment where people are afraid or embarrassed to share uh, ideas, even if they are weird. Because innovation, sometimes they come up with the weirdest ideas. And that's where the most success is, actually, and the best products come from. So it's very, very essential that you create that, the, the proper environment where everybody's comfortable sharing ideas, even if they're not along the mainstream. In terms of uh, the environment, um, 
um, uh, this, you guys are the leaders, basically, in my opinion, in, in, in having an excellent environment that creates creativity. And um, I'll tell you an example. Um, last year, we were in, in, in a company. I was benchmarking with them. And we were in a conference room. And the setting was very, very formal. That uh, I didn't feel the flow uh, very often. It, it was very, very rigid. And uh, we took a break, and they had you know, a nice setting, in the, the, the break area with coffees and, and drawing boards. And, and then the conversation became 100% different. It's like I'm talking to different people in a different company about a different topic. Just by changing the setting itself, we were talking completely different than what we had before. So what I often like to tell people is, when you're trying to predict the future, don't base it on technology we have today. Because if you do that, you'll be very, very limited in what you can predict. So what you need to do is look at what patents are being in what areas, what venture capitalists are investing in, what research papers. Uh, and give you all these data points will give you, we want, they will not give you uh, the direction where we're getting, but will give you better, better points in the chart to predict uh, a trend, and you'll be able to be much more successful in establishing where the whole direction is going. And if you invest early on, then by the time all these technologies become mainstream, guess what? You're going to be the top. You're going to be the leader. And, and you're going to have significantly strategic advantage compared to anybody else in the market at that time. So um, the, um, when I was the technology relationship management and, um, and doing previous roles, so I noticed a lot of the technology and the gaps that we have, they're very similar to other companies and other industries. Uh, for example, the oil and gas industry, I did, I did a lot of work in trying to develop mutual synergistic partnerships with products that we can use for both. And um, at, the, at the beginning, people were having issues from both, actually, understanding the value from NASA and from the oil and gas industry. And um, we had one time a meeting where we brought five engineers from NASA, five engineers from, from one of these oil and gas companies, and it was almost like dragging them. Nobody wanted to do it. So this, you're wasting my time. I don't want to do it. So we forced them, they got there. I'm telling you, by the time they got together, we couldn't separate them. I mean, they had so much in common that, that it, 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 they found the, the, the synergy between what they were doing. And, 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 and if you do that, then you can develop a product with more partners, you can use less resources, you can have better perspectives, more ideas, more innovation, different from different angles, and do, making it much faster. So why not do that, you know? Uh, and not necessarily, uh, you can, like I said, it doesn't have to be competitors. It can be somebody from a different industry and solve common problems that will make, make big sense. So if we implement that, I think the possibilities are endless. Uh, we can achieve things that we've never been able to achieve by ourselves. And especially uh, for us, for example, uh, looking at space exploration, I think eventually that's going to be an international effort uh, with all the international community having a goal and achieving it together. And if we do that, there is no limitations, and we'll be able to do absolutely anything we can. So with that, I conclude the presentations, and thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks so much. Right. Huge thanks to Omar uh, for talking to us today. So we have a few minutes. I know some of you probably have to rush off to other meetings, but for those of you who are here, we have our trusty microphone that we can throw out into the audience. So does anyone have a question that they'd like to share, that they'd like to ask? Please raise your hand if I can see you amidst the sea of people who are departing their seats. Does anyone like to ask a question? We have one over here. Okay, I'm going to throw it to you. <coughs> Speak into the black bit. Yes, there you go. Hi. Uh, Hi, thank you for coming and sharing these uh, very interesting thoughts about innovation. Um, I, j I was just wondering, uh, so you talked a lot about different types of industries and uh, different types of structures. Uh, I think some of it is uh, very uh, R&D and technology based. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here we are a lot also uh, sales teams. Um, so wondering how we can derive learnings from uh, what you shared uh, in terms of uh, driving innovation for sales teams, basically? No, that's, that's a good question. So it doesn't have to be only technology, right? I mean, even the governance model, how do you, how do you interact? The structure of the, the organization, uh, the environment, like I said, in terms of creating things, how do you compensate people with good ideas? Uh, how do you empower people that don't uh, take part of the, the process to become, become part of the process? So these are elements you can apply to any other industry. It doesn't have to be certain aerospace or technical or research and development. The key elements can be applied across the line and in every single thing. 
and they will find substantial value from, from, from uh, trying to do that. Except benchmarking is, is so significant that I try to do it at least once every two months, try to visit a new company, learn from them. And the more diverse the company, the better it is for me, because I learned new things that I didn't know before. And eventually you build this knowledge that you'll be able to, to apply into your organization that's gonna have be much more successful. Thanks. Yeah, I'm okay. uh, there's another question up there and one here as well. Do your best <coughs> to throw it as far. Yes, there you go. Okay, you get it because you're closer. <laughs> Hi, Omar. Thanks hey. for your very inspiring talk. Yeah, um, thank you. You started off um, saying, like, so in the, in the face of automation and in the face of um, an changing environment, like, um, I was asking myself, so what will we be doing, right, when there are self driving cars and yeah. we have plenty of time and yeah. perhaps not in a job? And um, as you moved on, talking about creativity, design thinking, um, would you agree or what would you say um, is the role of a human being and yeah. um, will we be, you know, educating people to be creative thinkers perhaps because yeah. ultimately it's, that's what makes us human and that what differentiates us from artificial intelligence, I believe. Uh, absolutely. And that is the question, actually. That is the main question that we need to answer. What is the role of people? And um, I'm Unfortunately, people uh, become touchy when you talk about this topic. It's nothing touchy. It's just a fact, you know, uh, whether it's going to have impact like this or like that. It's something that's going to have an impact. There's, we know that for 100%. And uh, what is the role of humans? That is something we need to have think tanks between governments, between industry, between academia, and think about what is going to be roles for humans that's going to be, regardless of what automation, what artificial intelligence um, environment we're going to be able to have, we still have a structure to where humans can have big impact and certain uh, qualities and attributes that human have, you will never be able to, re to, to, to reproduce with the, with the system, artificial intelligence system. But we need to find what those are. How do they fit into an economy? What is the economy going to look like? Uh, sometimes I even think about starting to publish a paper on the future economies after all these things happen. Because these are unknowns. I mean, that is the main question. And we're never, never going to be able to solve it unless we put big teams of people from different diverse industries working together and, and, and we'll be able to some get some answers to these. Hmm. Thanks. There's a question up there behind you. There's two of them even. Go for it. Uh, thank you for coming and sharing your interesting ideas. Okay. Uh, you're starting um, the presentation with the slides about the future of workforce, that uh, humans will need to compete with robots <laughs> and uh, artificial intelligence in uh, perspective of some professions. Right. So what would you recommend for, for example, f now, what, what we should what we should invest yeah. to learn now to be competitive in, in 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, it's, it's funny because we, we, that's exactly what we were talking with a group of people actually a few months ago. So what, what are things that will be difficult, very difficult for humans to be replaced? Uh, people, the the, so that's usually the creative portions of it, the creative arts, uh, the creative environment. But um, so, so there is, how, how do you, st the thing is, these, even though we can make an impact, we can increase the, the amount of jobs that human can, can, can take, it's still, it's not enough to, to, for the whole market uh, infrastructure. Uh, and like I said, this is very different. For example, in the beginning of the century, people thought that industrial revolution will keep everybody away from jobs. And we found, obviously, it wasn't true. Uh, people just readapted and they used their skills somewhere else. Now, the thing here is if we're talking about creating new species that are substantially smarter than humans, and they can do so many things. Um, like I said, if you will be very, very difficult in 100 years if you can distinguish between a humanoid robot and a person. Uh, the more we advance, it's become very difficult. So how do you compete with that? I mean, still, with, we haven't solved uh, these questions. are very valid question. And, and obviously, if we know the answer, we'll start putting all the resources to, to, to creating the solid infrastructures from today so we can actually have a balance uh, and we'll be able to minimize that, that, these impacts. That, yeah, that, very good question. Thanks. There's one behind you. I can still write better poems than machines, so I think. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, hi there. Um, I have a question about the space exploring and the, the, the technology that we use in that. So we, we have these shuttles that are already near, I don't know, the, uh, um, the end of the solar system. And of course, the uh, operating system and the machines used of them, they are of course outdated. How do we plan on the future missions to have them constantly being updated? Do we plan on uh, artificial technology that will update itself? Or do we plan to, 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 to send uh, different modules to update it on the way? Yeah, so that, yeah, so, uh, that depends on the mission you're trying to design. 
if you're designing something with the intention of going to a planet to take some pictures and come back, uh, probably the time period is, it doesn't give you, it's not really necessary. But for longer missions, that's definitely going to be important. I don't know if you guys heard of the Breakthrough Initiative that's being put together. Okay, so this is an initiative that's going to uh, enable us to send um, a vehicle, what I call a vehicle. It's a, it's, a, it's a hardware, one gram hardware, powered by laser. And it's going to go at a 20% of the speed of light. And it's going to go to Alpha Centauri, which basically is the closest star that we have here. And we found that there is habitable planets in Alpha Centauri. So habitable planets, um, it's essentially um, a term we call uh, but for planets that are surrounding stars. So for life to exist, uh, it has to have certain distance from, the, from the, the star. If it's too close, then the water will evaporate. If it's too far, it will freeze. And, um, and also it has to be certain size. If it's too small, it will d have difficulties keeping an environment. If it's too big, it will trap poisonous environment. So it's a very unique thing that we need to have to, to, to have life. Obviously, there's billions of galaxies, so the possibilities are endless. But um, for missions that are going to send that will take a long, long time, then definitely uh, it will be important to start implementing some of the uh, elements you're mentioning. It will be difficult um, uh, sending uh, instructions from Earth because it will take such a long time to reach them. And by the time you reach them, it's probably already obsolete. So how do you develop something where the, the system itself can, can, can update? So I think that's, that's, that's a very important turning point. When can artificial intelligence make changes to itself and adapt and, and change the algorithm based on what it's learning? Now we're talking about complete paradigm shift here, but it will be very important for long-term missions. I think we're unfortunately out of time, yeah. folks. I know we uh, have to close it out. So what I will say is uh, perhaps uh, yeah. thank you very much yeah, to you, you, Dr. Yeah. Omar, for coming yeah. today. Please give a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah.